Hey, I'm Ali Ehrman. I'm a genomics analyst at ARK Invest. I cover therapeutics, including gene editing, gene therapy, immunotherapy, stem cells. And today we're going to talk about gene editing, which is one of our big ideas for this year. So let's do a little deep dive here. So we've spoken about um, an importance convergence, and that is the convergence of DNA sequencing, artificial intelligence, and CRISPR. Let's dig a little deeper on artificial intelligence. What does that include? So that includes machine learning, deep learning. It also includes things like AlphaFold, which is a neural network-based algorithm that can predict protein folding. And this whole convergence can actually revolutionize healthcare. And so we've also discussed this a little bit previously, and that is that this convergence can accelerate uh, market improvement by 25%, and it can decrease failure rates by 25%. Both of these then will accelerate delivery and timelines, and it can create a plethora of new therapeutics that could be sent to the FDA for potential approval. This really opens up a new class of therapies, gene editing therapies, gene therapies, and they're really starting to get into the clinic now and looking to get approval. An example of this is indications like hemoglobinopathies, like sickle cell disease, beta thalassemia, and even TTR, which we saw really great data for first in human in vivo data in late last July. Because of all this, and based on ARC's research, the market caps of gene editing and gene therapy companies could grow 54% at a compound annual growth rate, and that could scale from 130 billion, what it is today, to over 1 trillion in 2026. Now let's take a step back and try to understand all of the factors that are contributing to the innovation happening here in gene editing and gene therapy. So first we'll talk about the pace of gene editing and innovation and how it is accelerating. So there are three main gene editing nucleases that we talked about. So zinc finger nucleases, talons, and CRISPR. Zinc finger nucleases use engineered zinc finger repeat domains to target specific sites in host DNA and they induce double-stranded DNA breaks with the nucleus. If you look at the chart here, it took about eight years from its first eukaryotic edit to the time of its first human ex vivo application. So let's unpack some of the terms there. What is a eukaryotic edit? Well, it's an edit of any organism or cell that has a clearly defined nucleus. However, since we're talking about not human, another way to say this is that um, this would be uh, the first successful gene edit on a non-human eukaryotic cell using the specific gene editing method that we're talking about, which in this case is zinc finger nucleases. Let's now unpack ex vivo. Ex vivo is when the editing is taking place outside of the body, whereas in vivo is when the editing is taking place inside of the body. For more information on the differences between in vivo and ex vivo, you can look at our big ideas from last year where we talked about the shift from ex vivo to in vivo gene editing. As new nucleases were developed, talons, CRISPR, and even new functionality was added to the CRISPR nuclease, you can see that innovation timelines really accelerated. So in the example we just gave, we said it took eight years for zinc fingers to do what CRISPR could essentially do in three years. We believe that these timelines could get even shorter in the future as new developments and new improvements continue to proliferate. We're going to have a discussion with David Liu and we'll talk about base and prime editing, which were both developed in his lab, and how quickly Andrew Anselon, who's a postdoc in his lab, went from conception to first successful experiment. And the acceleration there was pretty remarkable. In addition to speed though, these newer nucleases or ones with increased functionality may be also able to address more clinical variants, which means that they'll have the ability to address even more diseases with potential cures. Currently, we believe base and prime editing could address many more variants of concern. And as you can see here, prime and base editing, which are the CRISPR derivatives, um, can address even more diseases with 79% and 59% respectively. So as mentioned, CRISPR may be a superior gene editing method for many diseases, indications, and experiments. However, it's not a one thing fix all, so not for everything. But we described what a zinc finger nuclease is. Maybe now let's define what a talon is. So a talon, or transcription activator-like effector nuclease, what it does is it targets the host DNA using a, new, a unique modular protein. And similar to zinc finger nucleases, it induces a double-strand break with the nuclease. 
CRISPR, on the other hand, stands for Clustered Regularly Interspaced Short Palindromic Repeats, and it uses a protein RNA complex to guide its nucleus to a target site, and if used alone, also causes double-strand DNA breaks. We'll outline a little later why that could be problematic. Here, however, we outline why CRISPR may be a superior modality for some things, although not for everything. We will get into that a little later as well. One, it's cost effective. It's quicker to make a construct, so it takes days instead of weeks or months like with zig finger nucleases. It's pretty easy to use, so there's not much technical difficulty. It's an RNA-DNA interaction, which is less complicated than a protein-to-DNA interaction. Delivery is also really important here. And delivery is easier because it's not two proteins around the target. Instead, it uses a guide RNA to get the nuclease to the specific site in the genome where it needs to travel to. Lastly, let's touch on multiplex editing. So multiplex editing is doing more than one gene edit, and it's much more difficult with zinc fingers or talons. And that's because CRISPR is able to engineer. It's easier to engineer. It's easier to get it where it needs to go. As you can see, CRISPR here is shown in purple, talons are shown in green, and zinc finger nucleases are shown in red. What we're showing here is sort of the proliferation in CRISPR, both in academic journals, in papers, in publications, and also in clinical trials. If you look at the chart on the left, you can see that in 2012, which is when the Emmanuel Charpentier and Jennifer Doudna paper came out, the proliferation of the papers just continued to accelerate after that. They also later won the Nobel Prize for this discovery, and it's continued to proliferate since then. In terms of trials, this started around 2015, where we see a strong proliferation of CRISPR trials based on its ease of use. Although CRISPR's functionality does extend beyond just gene editing. So as you can see here, it can do transcriptional activation, meaning it can turn on genes that are dormant or not expressed, it can do transcriptional regression, which means it can silence genes, for example, if something may be toxic. It can also turn genes off or on, known as epigenetic control. And what's interesting is also diagnostic imaging. So diagnostic imaging could be helpful. We've seen it be helpful during the COVID-19 pandemic because it's cheap, it's easy to use, you don't need as much infrastructure. So it can be very helpful, especially with the thought of third world countries. But back to the heart of what we think are really important use cases of CRISPR, which of course is gene editing. So by increasing functionality for CRISPR, we may be able to treat conditions that we previously thought couldn't be treated. CRISPR all the way to the left, in the picture you can see the green there is the nuclease, the black on top of it is the guide RNA, and you can see that the guide RNA will take the CRISPR to the exact location that it needs to go to. Here we just talk about some of the differences. So CRISPR is relatively small, um, which is a positive. It's about four kilobases, and it has a specific PAM, or a protospacer adjacent motif dependence. What that means is that it needs to have a specific landing spot in order to get where it needs to be in the genome. If there is no PAM sequence near the cut, then engineering may need to be done, if it's possible, to get the nuclease there. This PAM sequence is typically around three to four nucleotides downstream from the cut site, which could mean that you may have trouble getting a nuclease to a particular region of interest. And as mentioned previously, zinc finger nucleases, talons, and CRISPR create these double-stranded breaks or cuts, which can cause indels. It can also cause a lot of other byproducts, which could potentially cause unintended consequences and potential off-target edits. Using CRISPR alone will get fewer addressable clinical variants because obviously CRISPR alone is great for disrupting genes. So an example of that is like sickle cell, where you want to disrupt adult hemoglobin to turn on fetal hemoglobin. But that may not be the right choice for addressing single base pair changes, insertions, or many others. Base editing is a way to correct misspellings or base letter changes within the genome. The size is a little larger, and it requires specific landing spot within the genome or a PAM. But this creates single-stranded NICs as opposed to double-stranded DNA breaks, which should help with off-target edits and, of course, can address a larger amount of disease variants. If you look at the picture here for base editing, we have the same green, which is the nucleus. We have the RNA guide, which will take it to where it needs to go. And in purple, we have a deaminase. The deaminase is going to cause the chemical conversion of one base to another. 
Lastly, for prime editing, which is the newest innovation, it's slightly larger, but it has a relatively low dependence on a PAM, which is the specific landing spot for the genome, which means that it can get to more sites and it expands its ability to treat even more clinical variants or mutations. This makes sense because if you're able to get to more areas of the genome, it of course also only nicks one strand of the DNA like base editing, which should help with off-target editing and increase functionality as we don't need to just disrupt the genes. When you look at the picture here, we again have in green the nuclease. Then we also have an RNA, which in this case we call a PEG RNA or a prime editing guide RNA. And in purple, we have the reverse transcriptase as opposed to a deaminase, which we use for base editing. And a reverse transcriptase is an enzyme that can generate DNA from an RNA template. So just to close, as we mentioned at the start of the presentation, gene editing and therapy companies could reach over 1 trillion in market cap by 2026. The chart here shows in green, the gene editing and therapy market cap as a percent of the pharma biotech enterprise value. And in purple denotes the same for gene editing and gene therapy, but for R&D. Gene therapy and gene editing could offer real cures for disease rather than masking symptoms or perhaps giving a little bit of relief, but not a cure, as many therapies today offer. Because of this, we could see a rise in their funding, in clinical trials, in research, and even in approvals. So R&D spending of these types of therapies could actually rise from 3 to 17% by 2026 because of, the, because of the promise of these innovations, but also because of the fast pace of innovation. In addition to R&D expenditures, as we mentioned, the market caps could command a 54% compound annual growth rate and could be from roughly 130 billion to what it is today for it can get to 1 trillion in 2026. Thanks very much to everyone for listening and stay tuned.